So welcome to the renowned Mike Fernandez Global Business Leadership Series. His generous support has allowed us to bring to the college, the community, and our students as part of this special series, Dr. Bernard Meyerson, Chief Innovation Officer at IBM Corporation, Mr. Laxman Narasimhan, the President of Pepsi Latin America, former U.S. Ambassador Donna Reinach, the VP of Boeing, and most recently, Mr. Eduardo Goyo, the Regional Vice President and President for Latin America and the Caribbean for Visa. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is truly my pleasure to hand things off to my great colleague, Romy Batia, who will formally introduce our speaker and moderate our conversation. Romy? We have a full house. This is great. Um, it's a pleasure for us here and a privilege to have today one of the top executives at Microsoft. Uh, Mr. Cesar Cernuda, who you all are going to get to hear from, has had a very distinguished career, over 20 years at Microsoft. When you think about careers and being in a company and working with a company for that long, it's truly an achievement. And he's done tremendous work at Microsoft. He has been the Vice President of Sales and Marketing for the LATAM region. He's been the President of Microsoft for Asia Pacific. And now he is both the president of Microsoft Latin America and the corporate vice president for Microsoft. He's incredibly busy. We found the one week that he was here in South Florida to be able to bring him in. And uh, he has a presentation to share with all of you, and then we're going to have a conversation afterwards. So without further ado. Thank you so much. Well, good morning to everybody. It's my great pleasure um, to be here with you all. Um, I was um, saying, I was sitting there. 25 years ago. So thank you so much for the invite. Um, I'm pleased to be here. One of the things that I'm, um, I must say is when I look into this college and what you represent, it's quite impressive. Not just the number, again, 165,000, but how this, all of you, help and support the community. How we're getting some insights, not just on the students and the locations, but actually the outcomes and the impact and I'm a strong believer that in life, we're here for a purpose. And serving our community and actually making a better and greater world is a big part of my own motivation every day. One of the reasons why I've been 20 plus years or 20 years plus in the company is exactly that the mission of Microsoft is very aligned to the mission and the values that I have. So is there anything that I would like to share with you as you go and prepare yourselves for the future is make sure that whatever you're gonna do in your life, you feel it. And whatever you're gonna have to do every single day is something that you believe in it and you feel passionate about it. Because that will make a big difference. And I say this sometimes to our colleagues inside the company. I tell them, if you don't believe in what we're doing, if you don't believe in the people around you, if you're suffering, don't waste your time. Go and find a place where you are happy. Go and find a place where you can develop yourself in a different way. So as a big recommendation, I mean, you're sitting here because you made the decision to come here, hopefully, <laughs> you know, and spend this um, 45 minutes with me or with all of us. And that's another thing that I will share, which is don't think that you will finish learning in the next three years or four years whenever you finish college, because that's just the beginning. So I spend a lot of time learning myself, reading, getting in courses, external or internal, because the moment that I stop learning, that's the end of my career. So with that, I want to start with this slide. I know that most of the people here is quite young, but um, I want to make sure that you get a little bit of sense of what's happening right now out there, what is happening in the market. There's a picture of the flat iron. You can see a 1905 and 1925. The difference between those two pictures it's very simple. You see all these horses on the left side, and you see all these cars on the right side. The discussion back in 1905 was all about, hey, what do we need to feed these horses to make them faster? The discussion was not about, hey, what if we bring cars? When people started talking about cars, there was a lot of resistance. Part of it, there were 100,000 horses and riders that had a job. There were all these jobs around managing all those horses, you know, running all that business, cleaning all the mess that the horses will, you know, have in the streets, having places for the horses to, you know, sleep, feeding the horses. You follow me. So there was a lot of resistance for the change. And that's why it took 20 years 
something that is super simple for us to understand. Say, look, it didn't make any sense right now to go in brickling horses versus cars. Well, there were 20 years of that discussion and resistance. Today, we're living the fourth industrial revolution, and it's called the digital transformation. And you're very lucky because you are learning and living with it very naturally. But many people from my generation are struggling to go and go through that change because each time that you go through a change, you have resistance. Naturally, you rather prefer to do things that you know than things that you don't know. So you know how to ride the horse. You don't know how to ride the car or to drive the car. So that change is something that you're very lucky now because you're in the core of this digital transformation that we are living. So many governments, many companies, many institutions, many colleges, universities are going through that change where some even economics, basic economics models are changing. There's a huge discussion that the new currency is going to be the data. Tell me how much data you have and what are you doing with the data that you have in your organization and we'll let you know what is the value of your organization. And then there's many other elements coming like privacy, security, regulations, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the world that we live in. And that's why the transformation opportunity now is really led by artificial intelligence. So if I go and ask how many of you know what artificial intelligence is, what will be quite a number of people. How many of you, I'll give you some insights on, on this question. How many of you have been using last week artificial intelligence? Less than half. 30%. How many of you last week have searched something on internet using, let's go and say Bing or using Google? Okay, so for those of you that say no before, welcome to artificial intelligence, for example. Most likely you have used an algorithm, most likely you have done some artificial intelligence in the back while you were doing that. How many of you have used your voice to tell a command to your phone? Welcome to probably artificial intelligence behind that as well. So that's something that is now saying, oh, I didn't know that I used that. Last week I was giving a conference in Spain and I had this 250 entrepreneurs, chairmen of the board, CEOs, um, definitely different generation than this room. Um, nothing against generations, but probably the most, the youngest one might be 45, 50. And I asked, the same questions. When I ask how many of you have used artificial intelligence ever, nobody raised their hand. When I ask how many of you have searched, I say, everybody said, me. I said, most likely you have done artificial intelligence, and everybody said, wow. So this is kind of the, the shift that we're living and how technology is more and more part of our day-to-day -day lives in a very natural way. Now, here's the beauty. We're humans, humans being. And then we walk and we have feelings and we have, you know, feelings not just to, th to things but to people. We interact among ourselves. We have experiences. We have memory. So we apply all that knowledge. We get results. Very simple. How many times you say, that doctor is very good. Has a lot of experience. The doctor will look at you and say, oh, I can see these patterns and this is what you have. So imagine all that knowledge, all those feelings, all those experiences amplify with technology. That's what we see when we go to a doctor. The doctor says, I think you have all this, but I'm going to do all these tests to you. And most likely they will apply some technologies to get the results and say, I knew it. Or, hmm, no, actually I need to go and go deeper on that. That's a very simple example. This one, when you think about agriculture, Sometimes I say, well, is that really technology-wise? How is that working? I can tell you. There's a huge change in terms of savings, in terms of improvements. Many things that will happen if we use our ingenuity, our human knowledge, and we amplify that with technology. So when you think of artificial intelligence, think that, and there's huge discussions, I'm sure, and I heard that you had a session uh, last week, some of you, talking about artificial intelligence on how we're using ethically as well artificial intelligence, which is very important. How do we learn from the system and how we make and amplify all our knowledge to make it better 
and to create, as I said at the beginning, a better world and a better service for the community. So if you look to the history, this is what is really interesting. Look the time that it took to go through big changes. You can see there the automobile, which I talked before, internet, cloud. We are now in the artificial intelligence era. We've been talking about cloud computing, but the reality is all that data that is existing out there, everybody talks about the big data. How do we analyze that? And then how do we apply intelligence to all those informations that we have there. You are a generation that is using social media every single day. You generate millions, trillions of data. It's a non-structured data you know, when it's on, on the web. Probably for some of the service providers that you have, it's becoming a structure because that data is something that they might be using to understand better things, patterns, et cetera, et cetera, even to serve you better. There's also a lot of business around that data, as you can imagine. Some of those companies, they're huge on the stock market for very valid reasons, which is all that data is providing them great business around advertising, of course, direct marketing, et cetera, et cetera. It's a data-driven business. Now, think about this artificial intelligence, as I said before. What is the real core there? What is really happening? The reality is, as many of you say, hey, yeah, I'm using that and I kind of understand what this artificial intelligence is. Think about the cognitive piece and think about how all that artificial intelligence is helping you on the perception. Voice recognition, you know, image. So you go to a store, you go and buy, somebody will look at you and say, hmm, the person is happy, is not happy. You have cameras now. They show you something, or you're online, you see something, mm, say, they change it, they move it. You're having the recognition. How many of you have ever used a Skype translator? So you can speak in Spanish. Somebody in China is listening to me in Chinese. The person is speaking to me in Chinese. I listen to the person in Spanish. And Mr. Padron is watching the conversation and I get a transcript in English. There's artificial intelligence. There's machine learning. All this interaction is happening in the back. So artificial intelligence is learning. Basically, your ability to learn. Artificial intelligence is something where you will be able to analyze patterns. So based on, based on the past, you will be able to try to predict the future. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to bring an element of you know, perception, reality, and be able to, and capable to bring all those things together as we said, to amplify all the different pieces that you have been able to do or you're not able to do by yourself. That's how we're investing in artificial intelligence. And we're seeing the peak of the iceberg. We're really seeing right now the peak of the iceberg on all the things and the power that we'll be able to have integrating this human being capability, of course, and the different things that we can do on artificial intelligence. I think I have an example. I'm going to come actually with the CEO of Stalo um, Statelogic. We're going to be here with Statelogic. This is a startup in Argentina. And I want to use this as an example because one of the things that I feel so passionate about on um, this fourth industrial revolution is that I really think we're democratizing society. I really think there's a huge opportunity for everybody to make a much greater and bigger impact. This is a small business. It's called a startup in Argentina. They have basically developed these nano satellites, which they're bringing to the space. They're going to have 300 by 220. And these nano satellites are basically taking pictures and capturing information of the Earth. Because the CEO has a vision, concerned about the fact that we're going to be growing in number of population, we're 7 billion, growing very fast, and we might not be able to feed everybody in the planet. Actually, he's also very concerned on the fact that we might have issues around water, to provide water to every single person on the planet. So he's basically doing all this service for governments and organizations to ensure that we prepare ourselves for the future, capturing information and trying to 
with that information, say, you know what, there's places where we should be start planting now, or kind of bring agriculture for having food for the future, or how can we change this path or this other path to bring water to these other places? I'm going to be with him at Emerge in, a, in, a, in two or three weeks, right? He's going to be with me in my keynote, have invited him to go and talk about his vision and why he's using all this technology, where you can see there's all this big data, he's using artificial intelligence and cloud to really make a change and an impact in the world. I have a video to talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, and then I have a closing slide, and then we open for a Q&A, okay? Let me put this video. SwiftKey Symbols is a communication app for people who are non-verbal, and it supports them in expressing themselves. Rowan, my youngest brother, has low-functioning autism. He finds it difficult to communicate and can get very upset if he can't make himself understood. I took what we used at home with some symbols that my mum would print out, laminate, cut out, stick Velcro on, put them into folders, and I just thought I could make that easier. If we did it on an app, they're more fun for Rowan because he loves technology. The underlying AI technology which SwiftKey Symbols uses is the same technology which powers the SwiftKey keyboard. We use AI technology to be able to learn from the user's behaviour, to see what they like to use in terms of their own style of language, to predict what's going to come next. It works by having a library of symbols that you can pick and choose to build your sentence, and each symbol has a word associated with it. And that we use SwiftKey AI predictive technology to learn what you've used previously, sentences that you've previously built, and then we surface what word you might want next and what symbol you might want next to build your sentence. I want juice, please, Kate. <gasps> We developed it alongside Riverside School, which is a school specialising in learning difficulties. So to be able to express what they want without prompting is a really big thing. Go on then, ready? I, I, I want cow. We have so many pupils who are non-verbal, but still have so much to say. I think AI can just make everything in life more efficient so you can enjoy life to the max. There's no better feeling than to hear a child say something that they've wanted to say and the look on their face after they've, they've been able to say it. You can't really beat that because that's them expressing themselves and that's really what you want from them. It's joyous. I don't think I can think of a better word for it. It's complete joy and celebration. I think it gives you a, a bit of a sense on the power of technology, AI, what are the things that we all should be aiming for. Let me close um, with a quote, which is the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So I want to close with that uh, before we do the Q&A because I don't want to be confused or confuse anybody about all this technology, artificial intelligence. It all depends on us. And actually something else that I want to share with you, which is your life, your career depends on you. Um, my daughter is a first year of college. My son is a senior at high school. I tell them the same. I said, listen, your future depends on you, on your choices, on your decisions, you know, and how do you predict and you want to go and work on the things that you really like, you really love, and you should go and vision yourself. Um, I know that everybody tells you that because I'm young. That's the truth. I'm going to tell you, I interview a lot of people, senior people, general management positions, and I always ask them the same question. There's many others that I ask. But I said, in 10 years from now, where do you want to be? Not everybody has an answer. Why are you taking this job? Why are you joining Microsoft? They might be able to answer you that. I said, but if they don't have an answer for the next 10 years, five years, it's kind of tough. Because the first answer should be, that's what I want to go, and that's what I'm taking this direction. Not every single decision will take you to the same place or you know, will take you out of a place that you want to go. But it's very important that you try to have a dream and you have tried to have a vision and with that, you need to work very hard to get there. So with that, let me close. And um, you can have or access me in this different social medias. And I'm open up for a Q&A. So is he here? There? Yeah, wherever you wish. So Cesar, those are some, um, some very inspiring words. I think uh, where you left off right at the end with artificial intelligence is where I'd like to pick up. Because I think there are a lot of students here in the audience that are going to probably have a lot of questions regarding it. So... What I found very interesting was that so they're the alarmists who feel that machines are going to replace humans. 
they see artificial intelligence or they see some projection of it. What was very telling was in your slides, you noted amplifying human ingenuity, not replacing or substituting. So let's start there. When you at Microsoft look at AI and you look at it from the perspective of amplifying, what should those here in the audience think about in terms of how to harness the power of AI and where the human equation fits in? Yeah, there is a huge debate. I mean, it will not be true for me to come and say that technology, AI, will not replace some type of jobs because the creativity that I will have will be zero. The truth of the matter is AI and technology in general mm -hmm. are generating and will generate very, you know, a lot of new jobs. And it's very important that we all uh, try to work and develop those capabilities. Mm. I mean, there's a huge need of data scientists today. There's a huge need of people really understand the different features on cloud architects, you know, technology, and how to use all this big data. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's completely true what I said, which is artificial intelligence will ampl amplify the ingenuity of people and how, you know, our feelings and how do we have every single day. Mm. There's jobs that we're seeing that have been changing that we have been able to uh, mechanize somehow, okay. you know, which are many times low-income jobs that will be changing as well. And that's why it's so important that we all try to prepare ourselves for the future in a different way. And that's what I use the example of the cars and the horses. It's a good example to understand some of the projects that are happening. So net-net, um, yes, I think there's going to be a change of jobs. There's going to be a new generation of new roles created. And at the same time, so over time, we're going to see some jobs probably disappearing. So then for companies, uh, and you mentioned this at the very start of your presentation, as well as individuals here aspiring for a career in some of those companies, the digital transformation, how should they adopt a strategy to be ready to and be equipped for, for the digital economy? I'll say uh, clearly the digital transformation is not something only for technology companies. Okay. Every single organization is it changing, is using um, technology in a different way. So I'll say being able to go and learn from um, the new technologies. I mean, you guys are, are, are very strong on social. Understanding those capabilities will be something that are really much needed in many companies. Listening skills, what is happening out there, how the new generations are moving, what are the motivations are very key. Even more and more psychology or sociology Understanding people's behaviors are key for companies. Mm -hmm. So don't think about how oh, technology and IT companies are the only ones. Every single industry is impacted and affected. Financial services, manufacturing, you name it. So at the, at the Idea Center here, we, uh, we teach computer programming. Is it possible that computers can have now greater brain power than human beings? Computers are done by human beings. But uh, you're saying faster response, there's many, many data points there. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you're going to see that the power of executing and, and responding, you know, and we're seeing that is faster and greater. But the reality is you're the one programming what you wanted to get out of and how to use all that data points. So that's what we're seeing. So I, I know students here will have uh, some questions for you. Um, I want to pick up on one of the themes you talked about right at the end of your presentation that speaks to, for them, their future uh, and what they want to achieve. You and your position, your role at Microsoft, have held several executive positions. So what are, for you, along that path, career path, what have been the leadership principles that you have uh, embraced and that you can share with us? First of all, I'll say you need to be honest with yourself. There's things that you don't know. There's things that you know. How do you prepare yourself? I always had a dream, mm -hmm. trying to say envision the future and understand that I need to work hard for it. Mm -hmm. You will need to sacrifice things. There's always trade-offs. So I always said, hey, you will need to make trade-offs. I have friends that say, hey, I'm having fun. And I say, oh, I need to study. Um, hey, I don't work. I only work five hours a day. I need to work 10. You will need to make trade-offs. I, um, I made trade-offs. I've moved my family several times in my career. Um, there were trade-offs, are tough trade-offs that you will need to go and make. That's for sure. In life, you will always need to make those trade-offs. My biggest recommendation is make sure that each of those trade-offs that you make, make you happy. Feel good about it. Because many times we make the trade-off and we feel bad about the thing that we decided not to do. And you should feel better for the thing that you're doing. Second thing is, be a good person. I'm going to say that again. Be a good person. Many times, 
we get confused because we enter a company and we want to work hard and say, oh, I need to be better than the others. And that's fine that you want to be very good, but not at the expense that the others are bad and not helping others. Because your manager will notice that. Actually, what the manager, your company wants is people that can make others great, and that can help others great. It doesn't matter if you're a manager, it can be your peers. And your energy, your dedication, your motivation mm -hmm. are great assets that you will bring because the learning will come. Nobody's going to hire you because of all the learnings that you have and your experiences. Nobody's going to hire you for that. Once you start growing, you will have some experience and learnings, but people will look to your behaviors. I tell many managers, make sure that you hire people better than you. And managers normally say, no, I want to be the best. I'm the manager. And, you know, I was saying before that I'm still young, despite that I've been 20 years plus in the company. <laughs> but many times I've been the youngest, which doesn't really matter, but the youngest in my leadership team, even from all the people reporting to me. But that was one of the strengths because they were more experienced and I learned a lot from them. But then because I was really dedicated to help them to success, mm -hmm. they didn't want to be part of my teams. So I will strongly recommend you a, have a dream, fight for it, have a vision, don't give up, and then be a good person. I'm curious, what was your very first job? My very first job? Before That's you became the executive that you are today, yeah. I start, this is a funny one, I start with a, I don't think I've shared this one actually. I start one summer working a, in a night turn, you know, a overnight from 12 or midnight to 6 a.m., basically placing orders for books. Amazon didn't exist. <laughs> None of these online. So, you know, there was a summertime, so back to school. So all these schools were ordering books to a library and we need to place all the orders that a telephonist will get. So somebody will call, say, I need 10 books and they will put in a paper, forget the computer, and I will come overnight and just click them and put them there. That was my first summer internship. But uh, after that, I had um, an opportunity to work for a bank for... Um, Different, uh, I did uh, different summers and then uh, I actually started working in the bank. And after that, uh, when I was at college, I got a great offer to join a company called Software G. That's the way I started in technology and I worked there almost for three years. It was a mainframe, which probably you don't know what a mainframe is anymore. But there's like, you know, big, big, big systems, uh, technology, German company. I worked there for three years and a half until I got a call from Microsoft. And um, yeah, I've never been applying for jobs. You know, I've never been hanging around, I mean, I always tell people, I said, you will get offers and you will get calls and, and I'm with my team and, and I said, I'm sure you're getting calls from the competitors and if you're not, you should be worried. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you need to decide what you want to do in life and what, are your, what is your purpose. I've been realizing myself somehow in, in many different senses, mm -hmm. right? And business is one of them. For me, my family is very important, my friends as well. So how do you balance those things is the key you know, aspect for, for success. So long answer for that very small question, which was, mm -hmm. what was my first job? But that's been a little bit about myself. Great. So th this session is for all of you. There are many of you here in the audience that must have some questions. So there are mics that are set up. I would say if you can come to the mic as we're live streaming, we want to make sure we capture your questions. Um, <laughs> my name is Alexa Gonzalez, and I am actually a working professional. And I want to thank Miami Dade College because you guys set this up. And every so often, I find a moment to come back and learn about a different industry. So okay. that's really what brought me here today. And I want to ask you a question because, you know, when I think of Microsoft, I think of operating systems. With moving into, you know, AI, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's a huge business potential. If you can talk to what exactly and how you guys are going to monetize that, like, that's kind of what I'm thinking is how, how do you do business? Is it B2C? Is it B2B? If you can talk on that, that'd be great. That's a really good question. We feel super proud on the 40 years plus history on the company. We had a vision, or Bill Gates had a vision, which was a, a PC in every desk, so bringing technology everywhere. And that's how we end up in operating systems. Then we end up selling office, productivity, etc. And the company has been um, in a great shape, very good shape. I mean, very profitable, knowledgeable. There was a moment that we were not cool anymore. I'm trying to say that we're cool now. <laughs> And the reason for that was the reality we're seen as operating system and productivity company or office. The last years we decided to really change the company and be a cloud leader provider. Really transform the way we work with customers. Really transform technology wise to be on the top of the new wave of technology. If you see the last two pieces that I talk about was cloud and artificial intelligence. 
And you made a very smart question, which is, what is your monetization model? So, so think about years ago, a company selling operating systems making a good amount of money. Somebody comes and says, I'm going to do it for free. How do you compete against that? Very tough. Mm. Nothing is free. Just basically, it's a different monetization model for the other operating system, whatever operating system. Uh, I don't want to talk about competitors in, in a good or, I mean, actually, I would love to talk about all of them in a good way, but probably it's not the right use of my time. But, you know, there's no reason why I should talk in a bad way. But clearly, they came with a complete different idea. I'm monetizing that operating system, operating system because I'm getting all this data that I can monetize. So whatever you do here, I can get access to all this data and I sell it in a very, uh, not just legal, but profitable and, you know, very good way. So it was a real challenge for us. I said, hey, should we change that and should we go through a different monetization model for our own technology? So the answer is we decided to be best in class on privacy, best in class on security, best in class on technology. And we have changed somehow our monetization model, but basically, you know, people is, you know, using the cloud and pay as they use. Say, hey, I'm a small business, I have three users, and I just need to use this cloud service. I need this amount of data and I pay for it. I don't need to go and pay for all the other things. So we definitely have changed our monetization models, but we have not changed the core, which is, hey, we want to provide technology, and in this case, cloud services, artificial intelligence, and so on, to not just uh, companies, but also to people, to be able to achieve more and do more. So one of the big paradigms on, on artificial intelligence is there's companies that said, hey, you need all this technology, all these you know, machines and all these back office, and that's for very large organizations, and hey, I can give you inter artificial intelligence. We have different vision. We want to democratize that. We think that you know, using Cortana, for example, and with our own technology and bringing Azure, which is our cloud service, we can really have people and companies using artificial intelligence every day in a much better way. Yes, we have changed our monetization model. Yes, we have adjusted our strategy. Yes, we have tried to reinvent ourselves. And I feel that we have a much better momentum as a company right now. And also, we have done a big job of humility. When you become a large or larger organization and, you know, and you've been successful for some years, sometimes you, you make mistakes. And you are a bit more arrogant and you are a little bit more hero. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and Satya, as the CEO of the company, came and said, I want this company to be known as a learner company and not as a knower company. Many times you will come and say, I know it all. And I tell customers, if any of company comes saying they know it all in this new world, they're not telling you the truth. <laughs> we don't know it all. But we're going to learn as much as we can to help you. <laughs> you know, sometimes that doesn't leave, give you a lot of confidence to the customers because you're too honest. But the truth of the matter is being a learner is much more powerful than being a knower. All of you are here probably today say, hey, let me try to learn. You didn't come here to say, I'm going to know, right? So that, that's a little bit of a change on culture inside the company and also on the approach. Thank you. Hey, Morton. Um, I wanted to find out more about, um, you know, there's new technologies coming out like blockchain, crypto. How is Microsoft adapting to those new technologies? So I don't know if everybody understands blockchain. Actually, it's not that even simple. I mean, I can be very simple to try to explain that or get to the very complex setup. But we invest approximately 13 billion R&D a year in technology. Uh, that put us in the pole position, investing on technology every year. We have uh, many different R&D centers worldwide, even in regions, to try to leverage. I heard that last week you have mm -hmm. uh, some startups from Israel coming here. We have a big mm -hmm. lab, and we're investing. Uh, actually, I think some of them were working with us right mm -hmm. now, we're cloud technology. So blockchains, for example, is a, is a great technology that we are investing and in, definitely doing uh, a lot of investments to try to um, really position and help that to, you know, to um, propagate and, and even more to make it uh, more reliable and make it more secure. And, uh, and basically what we're doing with, you know, with that technology is enabling through Azure uh, many different industries to use it. You know, financial service is very high on it, as you know. So right now there's uh, different uh, financial service institutions working with us on our blockchain offering through our cloud offerings and trying to even link that to artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, and how do we can make progress there. But that is not only blockchain for financial services, which has been the industry 
uh, more and more looking into it. If you think about retail, that's another very interesting industry that is looking into blockchain and how the interchange between users have better access to data and, you know, and there's some even, you know, exactly, biomedical and others. So definitely we're going to see more and more um, trends. And, and, and at the end of the day, what you need to provide is um, a you know, secure ecosystem with technology that can really enable all these new technologies coming and setups. Uh, so seeing as earlier you spoke about what questions you ask in interviews about, you know, where do we see ourselves in 10 years and seeing that most of us are students, we're looking into internships and job opportunities. And I was wondering, um, in the application process for internships and jobs, uh, what do companies like Microsoft and other tech companies value most in the application, whether it's GPA, experiences, um, uh, you know, personal projects, stuff like that. What do you, what's your advice? I don't know if I should give you, I don't know if there's a big difference between the official <laughs> answer and the real answer. First, I would, I would not tell the truth if I said, I will give you a detailed answer because I don't really know. I'm not on the details on our, you know, just undergraduates or, you know, uh, applications process, how they work, etc. But I'm going to tell you the truth. The truth is, I look to people's energy, how hungry people is. Energy, hungry, and desire. So people will kill me, and maybe even some professors here talking about GPA, <laughs> and I don't want with this to invite all of you to don't care about the GPA, because you should. I mean, that's your job, <laughs> etc. But I'm a strong believer on the impact that people can make through the commitment, the energy, and the desire. The expert says that all that is shown on the GPA. Because in those years, you've been working so hard that you demonstrated on the GPA. And in some cases, might be true. Because it's true, they've worked hard and they've got a great GPA. But that doesn't mean that not having a great GPA, you know, you will lose the momentum, the opportunity. And I've been very clear inside my own company, saying, let's go and interview people. And we need people that are hungry. People that will bring the energy. I'm gonna give you an example that I use a lot. You go to a meeting and a seller comes and tells you, hi, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand up. <laughs> so you have a you know, seller comes to you and you're there and the person, hi, how are you? I'm coming here to sell you this. And you're going like this and try to look to the eyes of the person. I mean, there's no way in life that you will buy anything. <laughs> would you guys agree? But then somebody comes and comes and says, you know what, Bing, I'm going to do this and this. And suddenly you find out that you're in a super big excitement with the person and you buy whatever the person has told you. <laughs> the person leaves and then you say, what the hell do I need this for? Is that right or not? Well, so of course each of us are different and there's different proficiencies, etc. But... Don't never lose that. Fight for what you want. And if you have, you go and apply for a company and the company doesn't give you the opportunity. Actually, I'm gonna share this one. I applied for a company. I said never applied, but that's not true actually. When I was at college, uh, the university said, hey, uh, I, was, I was not the best student. I was not the bad, worst. I was maybe in the top tier, but I was not the number one. I mean, definitely was not the number one. Um, but I had a lot of energy and a lot of drive. So I got proposals to go to very nice companies, right, um, in college and kind of go and do the test and blah, blah, blah. So this is a very well-known company, and I did the test, and that was, in the, um, that was uh, not in my senior year, that was a year before. And I did the test, and I didn't get elected. So they didn't give me the, the, the training. And I really felt they screwed it up. Not that I screwed it up. I felt like you were making a mistake. So I decided to write a letter to the head of HR, which I said, dear Mr. Whatever, I'm blah, 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 I'm a student, blah, blah, you guys did a test. And basically, because of the test, you decided not to pick me. And I think you have screwed it up. <laughs> because I could be very good. I'm blah, and I wrote a letter, and I got a call back. And the person started laughing. I mean, the HR director of the country, forget, I was interviewed by probably, well, they didn't interview me, they did a test like 10 levels below. I made a big mistake because I had an ego, 
I'm happy now, but <laughs> back then. And the person said, I want to meet you in person because I might be interested for you to come and join us. And I said, no, I don't want to anymore. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and, and you know, it looks like great, but I, I mean, I went home saying I'm stupid. But I said to him, no, because if that's the way you pick people, I might not be interested. Now, I don't want you guys to take that as an example because probably it's the wrong one, but if I'm still in Microsoft, it's because of my energy. If I wake up this morning and came here and do this and I'm going to go back to the office and I travel a lot, it's because I love what I do and I, I believe in what we're doing and I believe in the change of the world. I'm very respectful to our competitors. You know, I, you know, it will be not true to say I want the best for them and the worst for us, that will be true, but I really believe that I feel part of a generation that is helping to change the world. And I feel like every morning my contribution is small, but my company is one of the companies that is helping to change the world. And that's big. So don't be shy, fight for what you want, you know, be strong. Uh, what do you think of the claim of futurists that by the year 2050, um, technology will be that humans will be able to live forever? Say that again, humans that will be? humans will be able to live like immortal, like forever, that, that, that's the, what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Would you want to? <laughs> that's another question. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer, to be honest. <laughs> I do believe technology will help us in many regards. Definitely if you look into the you know, average life cycle today versus years ago, or you know, clearly we're, we're getting older and older. And actually, we have a better quality of life. So that's great. Mm -hmm. There's great technology today. We have real examples. Uh, somebody was talking about uh, biomedical. Look, we have partners in Brazil, for example, that are bringing technology that is helping intensive cares, uh, using artificial intelligence, um, reducing 20% the death on intensive cares by being able to predict some of the behaviors or the patterns of the patients and anticipate to them, um, which is great. You have made me a tough question because it has a lot of components, that question. So I'm not sure that I'll be able to answer that um, because it will be crazy for me to go and answer that. I have my own belief and other things around it, but definitely I think that quality of life and length of life and is going to go uh, longer and longer. Uh, that's for sure. So that's why examples like the ones that I provided before. So that will be my answer. As we have looked through history, we have seen that human being, every time we have a problem, we try to fix it. We come with a solution. But the other thing is that the solution brings other problems. <laughs> Sometimes you fix one, the solution brings five problems. The AI from what I'm understanding, may create other problems as well. As we're seen in movies like Surrogate and The Terminator, which is even worse. So my question would be, what are the steps that you guys are taking so that Surrogate doesn't happen? Or, term or even worse, Terminator doesn't happen? Thank you. Great example. <laughs> um, definitely when you look into the, the world, the history, there's always been the bad guys out there. You know, there's always. So you go and say, hey, you create a bank and you have people coming and trying to steal the bank. We have seen how cars or all their vehicles have been used the wrong way as well. Unfortunately, we have seen that. There's many examples of things that, you know, definitely have done wrong things. And I will say it's not the technology that was the one doing that, it's us. Unfortunately, as a human being using a plane to do something that was not built for. That's a very simple answer, the one that I gave, but it's very important. Because I said at the beginning, make sure that you're a good person and you have a good purpose. And yes, here's something that is happening. Basically, we have improve our lives. You have said, hey, I don't need to go to IT now. I can do a call. I can even potentially do a Skype call. We can even see each other. Oh, thank you, technology. I remember when I joined Microsoft, I tell my kids every Saturday morning, 
I used to be in the office. I used to work very hard every Saturday morning. Many nights I will stay in the office. And my kids said, why you were not at home working? I said, I didn't have internet. And I'm young. <laughs> I didn't have internet at home. And the connection when I started having it, it was very slow. I'm thankful for all those progress. Now, we have all this data and we're seeing all these cyber attacks. So sorry, so now we're doing this, but we have all these problems. And say, you're right. You're right. The bad guys now mm -hmm. are trying to steal data. Mm -hmm. So we need to protect ourselves and we need to educate people on how to use all that and do it in a better way. On artificial intelligence, I said it before. It's not just about what are your privacy you know, statements as a company, who owns the data, what are you doing with that data, etc. But it's also very important how ethically you go and set up, you know, all this discussion of artificial intelligence. We just um, published a book between our head of, uh, um, uh, our president of the company, Brad Smith, and Harry Shen, our artificial intelligence lead, you know, worldwide corporate vice president, talking about this, this thing. So you're right. I think it's a big, big commitment from um, the industry and from all of us on how we're going to use artificial intelligence moving forward. This is a very important topic. Okay. Hello. What would a startup have to do to gain the attention of Microsoft? You mentioned a very hands-on approach uh, with the Argentinian startup. Thank you. So here's a very good question. Actually, very timely because last week, I believe it was last week, when we were two weeks ago, we announced our new program called Microsoft Startup for Business. So I'm saying this because for several years, we had a program called BizSpark. So the, for many years, we had a program called DreamSpark and BizSpark. DreamSpark is for students that have a dream and they want to go and say, hey, I need support, I want to bring my dream in life and you know, I need support from a company like Microsoft, you will go and apply for the program, Microsoft will provide you technology, you know, depends on, there's some different things there, they can even give you a mentor or we can actually give you a mentor, etc. But then you say, I'm, I'm done with college, I'm done studying, but I'm a you know, young entrepreneur, I'm creating my first startup. So I will recommend you to go online, take a look to that, right, to say, hey, how can I apply for the program, what are the type of things that we're going to get, you know, how to support you. But we have a huge community. Actually, here in South Florida, we have it. You know, I'm in charge of Latin America, as you all know. You know, we have different hubs, you know, Chile, Colombia, Brazil, actually. We have an accelerator in Brazil. So we're very linked. Uh, I believe there's a, there was a person here uh, some weeks ago mm -hmm. uh, talking about some of the things that they're doing for some of the startups here in, in Florida. And uh, we're supporting them as well to help. So I also have provided there my email and others, so you feel free to send me a note and I can put you in touch with somebody, so that's for sure. We are eager, I'm a strong believer on, and I was sharing this before, in this new world that we're living, you know, the opportunity for startups, which in fact, there's like small business, to go and really make a breakthrough is huge. So go and push for it. I'm Patricia Carlin, I work in the IT department at Carnival Cruise Line and we're a big Microsoft customer. I'm wondering if you can give me some tips on how to sell the cloud internally we have a lot of people who are, I, I would say, married to some older solutions and they believe and they have to have a piece of hardware. So can you give me some talking points to get them, you know, move them to the cloud? Great. That was my slide number two. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's true. I mean, the biggest challenge today is not technology. It's the cultural shift. And what you're talking about is how do we change the culture internally? And this needs to start from the top. So... I was last week, as I said, with all these CEOs and chairmen having a discussion. I told them, I said, listen, forget your IT department driving the change. They can enable you the change. But the change needs to start from you, from the top, from the board, from the CEO, from the leadership team. I mean, from an IT department, you might make it happen because you can explain the costs. If we move to the cloud, the cost savings will be X, Y, and Z. And then the CEO and the leadership team might say, yeah, let's move to the cloud. But users, you know, say, why should I need to learn something new when I'm very happy with what I have? So that change is, is tough, right? But it's very important that you go through a process of change on the overall thinking process. And, and that will bring you, there's different elements. One will be, of course, the cost associated to it. The second element of the cloud, which for me is actually more important than the cost, which the cost itself is huge is what are going to be the new monetization models for your company? What is the future of your company? Can you really afford, with all this change and the speed of change, 
you know, to be able to protect your you know, security-wise, the privacy of the data that you have, you know, the maintenance that you're going to go and deliver. What are you going to do with all those data analytics? How are you going to use artificial intelligence? So you go to a company like Microsoft and say, hey, I want to move to the cloud. I want to use your cloud services. And then basically, with the IT department, you will bring way more opportunities for the company to expand and, you know, be able to go and sell more and be much more modern on the approach to customers, knowledgeable, etc. So long story short, you have a big challenge, which is you need to go to your CEO, the leadership team to make that change happen. Frankly speaking, if you ask my agenda, I spend way more time than I used to talking to board of directors and CEOs that I used to do in the past. And many times it's you, IT CIOs, coming to my company and saying, hey, I need help. Can you bring the general money of the country or your president to go and talk to our board and have a good session about digital transformation, how this can affect? So we have time for two more questions. And for those of you that still have a question, uh, please feel free to stay here and, and, and uh, ask them afterwards. So the, the two, and then we'll be wrapping it up soon. I have a very quick question. I just, I was wondering what you would do in case of AI and the replacement of jobs. What I will do in case of AI and replacement of jobs, what do you mean? How you would work towards fixing something like that. Well, that's a big debate. That's what I was saying before. Here's what we're doing. I said before, there'll be jobs. The word disappear, it's emotional. I always say there's jobs that will change. But in fact, there's jobs that will disappear. But there's many new jobs that will be new. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're doing is investing you know, with many um, ministers of education in countries and many universities and schools to ensure that we bring new capabilities for people to take advantage of the, all the new jobs coming. More and more, you know, knowing how to code being, as I said before, experts on data analytics, data scientists, you know, understanding all these trends around social. Those are going to be great, great opportunities for new jobs. So you're saying, what is Microsoft doing? I'll say ethically, there's one thing that we're doing around artificial intelligence. But exactly on the point that you're making is we're working more and more to try to bring more skills and capabilities on all these new jobs that actually is a huge demand. Right now, there's a greater demand than people capable to fulfill the demand of jobs needed around those technologies. Um, I have a question about the artificial intelligence uh, and also the economic. Um, how does the artificial intelligence affect the economic globally in different technology businesses from now and future ahead of us as technology changes? That's a really good question. I mean, as I said before, there's no doubt that if you look into the last 10 years, how technology companies, the, the stock market, the value has been increasing big time. And there's a reason for that, which is all the value they're bringing to the rest of the industries. If you think about every single industry, they're looking exactly for that transformation. You go and say, go and talk to a retail company. They'll tell you, I need to be a technology company. You go and talk to a financial service institution and they say, I need to become a technology company. Every single organization is coding. Years ago, we used to say every organization needs to be a software company. But the truth of the matter is that change is really generating new economics, a new access, you know, an interaction to all of you. Just think about, this is very interesting. For, for your age, you go and say, look, how much do I use banking systems? How do I interact with banks? Versus other ways to interact and pay and et cetera, et cetera. What's going to be the future? How are you going to position? That's why all these fintech have come and provide some different services. That's why banks are acquiring fintechs and investing a lot in technology. It's not just artificial intelligence. It's digital, digital transformation is bringing new economics and new economic models um, where we're seeing just a peak of the iceberg. I mean, you're going to see that many things that we used to pay in the past are going to be free because basically they're going to monetize through the data they're going to generate, and that data will make them more profitable and richer. I think we have one last person. One last Just question. one. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how do you envision Latin America in terms of technology providers to the world, and what do you think we better prepare our young generation in our countries considering 
all the challenges we have in Latin America. I'm a strong believer, I'll talk about Latin America, but one of the things that I love about being today here is the diversity of the room. So I'm going to expand a little bit more to talk about emerging markets. Latin America for me is a great example of an emerging market. And, and, and then I'll, I'll make a comment on, on Latin America. I'm a strong believer on the opportunity that we have ahead with emerging markets. Historically, we have seen a huge difference between developed markets and emerging markets. Historically, we have seen a big difference between large organization and small business. When you think about a large organization and a small business, what are the differences? And then you come and say, well, the owner of the small business is looking for the top revenue line, making sure that they sell more, that they save costs so they can be more profitable and serve better the customers. The large organization is looking for the same. Well, the small organization wants to make sure the company has better value, the large organization the same. So what is the difference? The difference has been that the large organization, even in emerging markets, have had access to the greatest and latest technology, but the small business didn't. Today, the startup that you were telling me before, you know, is having access to all those technologies because in the new world of cloud services, you can go and say, I'm going to use Office 365, I'm going to use Skype Translator, I'm going to use Azure, these are Microsoft technologies, which is exactly the same technology that the largest bank or the largest institution that you might think in the developed market will be using, but now it's affordable for you because you pay per use. So you say, look, I'm only two people, so it's very affordable. I pay this amount of dollars and we can do it. So now the opportunity is just greater for everybody to make a, you know, a big turnaround. And that's where we're seeing all these startups coming all over the globe. You look 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you didn't see that many companies coming from the east part of the world. Now you see all these companies coming from Asia, even having greatest stock value and, and so on. Many people will not know this, but almost 50% of the digital invoicing in the world happens in Latin America. Just think about all the technology behind that happening in Latin America. And it's a consequence of many small business startups that build these digitax and e-invoicing solutions and then connect it to the government to make the big change. And that's generating a completely different economy. So I'm a strong believer. I'm a strong believer on the fact that there's 160, 180 million students in Latin America. The preparation, the skill set, the access to technology, it's almost the same that in other places. You can say, well, not everybody. I hear you. But the size is so big that we're going to see so many great things coming from these emerging markets. You know, and Latin America actually is very well positioned. Because one of the big differences between Latin America and other regions is that while in Latin America we all feel different, so Colombians will say, I'm very different than a person in Chile, and the Chilean is very different than the Argentinian and Mexico, and, and it's true. In Latin America, we have greater and way more similarities than other places of the world. Just think about Asia. I said, what do you think is the similarities between people in Thailand and Indonesia? They're different, but we're also different. But we have the same language. We speak Spanish. Many of us have the same culture, religion-wise, background-wise. There's a lot of trade agreements between the countries. So the opportunity in Latin America is much higher than in other places where they're still not there, you know, and the diversity is, is bigger. So um, I'm a strong believer in the region. I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Asia. I've been lucky because I have many different jobs. Mm -hmm. So I've spent some time in Africa years ago. I've spent time in Eastern Europe, of course, in the in the U.S. and in developed markets, but um, I'm a strong believer in emerging markets, and I definitely think that Latin America has a huge potential, a huge potential. So with that, I hope that um, you got a little bit of a sense on, on yes. what's going on, and I really like to come to these sessions because uh, it's always a, a great source of energy for me as well to look to your eyes and see how you're looking into things and how hungry you are for the future. So don't lose that. That's the most important asset. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.